Nigerian citizens feel the bite of President Mamadou Buhari's economic policy. The international push to vaccinate vulnerable people living in conflict situations. And a cutting edge indoor camera takes home security to the next level. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. The brutal civil war in Syria continues to claim innocent lives. Airstrike strike a hospital in a rebel-held area in the city of Aleppo overnight Thursday, killing at least 27 people, including three children, and the city's last pediatrician, that's according to the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. The Syrian army denied that its warplanes targeted the hospital, according to a report by Syrian state television. The al Qads hospital was supported by the international medical charity Medicines on Frontiers, which says the medical facility was destroyed after being blasted by a direct airstrike. This video uploaded to a social media website purports to show the aftermath of the airstrike and rescue officials carrying injured and dead bodies from the rubble. Uh, paramedics and volunteers are also seen in chaotic scenes trying to get the injured into ambulances and vehicles. The British-based uh, Syrian observatory says 91 civilians have been killed in airstrikes in the past six days in Aleppo. Meanwhile, the United Nations Syria envoy Stefan de Mistura says he plans to hold another round of peace talks next month, but called for a ceasefire to be revitalized before setting a date. And the International Red Cross says a humanitarian crisis in Aleppo is looming because of the fighting. Now, a soldier suspected of killing 11 people at a military barracks on the island Cape Verde has been arrested. Authorities say the 24-hour manhunt for Manuel Silva ended Wednesday when he was stabbed in the capital prior while driving a stolen taxi. He is accused of killing eight soldiers and three civilians at a military base 45 kilometers from prior. Uh, the motive for the attack is under investigation. Well, the spokesman for Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari, Garba Shehu, says preventing attacks by armed herdsmen is a top security priority. An attack this week by armed herdsmen left dozens of people dead, clashes over land use between the semi-nomadic cattle-herding Fulani people and more settled communities that practice a mix of farming and cattle rearing claim hundreds of lives each year. Now, the clashes have become more frequent in recent months. The Nigerian government is already contending with the Boko Haram insurgents in the northeast and a resurgence of pipeline, pipeline attacks in the oil-rich southern Niger, Niger Delta region. Now, Fulanese are Muslim, and the communities with which they are in conflict in central Nigeria tend to be Christian. For more on the inter-ethnic clashes, reporter Samuel Okocha joins me live via Skype from Lagos. Uh, Samuel, now the clashes uh, between the Hadsmen and uh, farming communities are historical. Uh, why have they become more frequent in the last uh, few months? No, thanks for having me. I, I think the problem is a result of um, some kind of competition for scarce resources. And when I mean scarce resources, I'm talking about land and not just land, you know, fertile land that uh, these fits men can use to feed their, their cows. And so this is the narration. You know, we've had climate change issues in time past, and we are beginning to see the result now. This um, headsmen are mainly from the north, and north there is this reduction in rains. Um, because of this re reduction in rains, we are seeing that grazing fields are reducing, and so there is a forced migration from the north to the south, where we appear to have more rains. Now, and uh, Samuel, we know that uh, the government in the past has tried to help these communities coexist. Have they announced any specific strategy uh, on how they will probably tackle this in a different way? Yes, um, well, right now what we are hearing um, uh, are talks about um, stakeholders meeting. And so, for example, we have senators, that is lawmakers, from the south-south and southeast of the country um, trying to talk a meeting that will offer some kind of solution. Right now, it's very, very difficult to pinpoint, um, you know, any major strategy. The only thing we've heard is that attackers will be brought to book. But it remains unclear 
you know, a master strategy, you know, to resolve the problem. Now, we know that uh, it's also a time when Nigeria is grappling with the threat of Boko Haram. Do people have confidence that the government can restore peace in those areas at all? Uh, yes, uh, uh, people are cautiously optimistic because Boko Haram is a problem that the government is still trying to solve permanently. And so the issue of headsmen uh, coming up will be another challenge to the government. But I think um, it goes beyond the federal government. We are, we are seeing um, signals from even state governors trying to, you know, come together to resolve the problem. You recall that this problem is not just... Uh, this problem are actually isolated cases. So what it means is that um, it's not as widespread, you know, as um, you would think. So, for example, we have it in Enugu, for example, and we have it. So, so the idea is that uh, the, the the problem requires some kind of um, creative strategy. You know, so it's not just about the federal government; it's also about state government, for example. You know, talking to traditional rulers within the communities. Definitely uh, a local and national problem. Samuel, thank you very much for your reporting. Uh, Samuel Okocha reporting live via Skype from Lagos. Now, despite the global drop in the price of oil, Nigerian President Mohamedou Buhari is refusing to allow the country's currency to devalue. Uh, this is leading to a shortage of foreign exchange. Chris Stein has more as the country deals with a severe fuel shortage. People are feeling the heat in Africa's largest city, and it's not just because of the weather. Motorists are waiting hours to buy scarce fuel, and prices of everything from snacks to plastic bags are rising. Inflation hit an annual rate of 13% in March, an almost four-year high. In market prices, the food stuff, even the house rents, even the ordinary water we are drinking, everything has increased, so we are feeling it. Most of Nigeria's consumer goods are imported. Instead of devaluing the Naira, the central bank has restricted trading in foreign currencies. That means traders either cannot get dollars to buy imports, or they pay inflated prices for their foreign currency. Gasoline is a key import that has been affected. Motorists are waiting hours to fill their tanks. This for scarcity alone is a problem. Uh, if you know the area all the way where I come to look for fuel here, it's very far off because of the scarcity. Some motorists resort to buying black market fuel of dubious quality at inflated prices, and the fuel scarcity is having a snowball effect, leading to higher costs for everything, driving inflation. Economists say devaluation would cause inflation to spike temporarily, then stabilize and curb the reliance on expensive black market dollars. But Buhari insists devaluation has not worked in the past. His goal is long term, to grow local industry. Some of his supporters are willing to wait it out. I think it's good policy because uh, it's just a matter of uh, a few, maybe a year or some months. You will see everything will be okay for everybody. The question is, how long will Nigerians wait? Chris Stein for VOA News, Lagos. Well, in nearly five years after its independence, peace remains elusive in South Sudan. A U.S. congressional hearing on the prospects of peace and security for South Sudan Wednesday brought together members of Congress, human rights representatives, South Sudanese nationals, as well as members of the civil society. John Prendergast, founding director of the NAF project, testified during the hearing on the continued suffering of the people of South Sudan. Speaking to VOA, Mr. Prendergast had these words for President Salva Kiir and First Vice President Riek Machar. I would say to uh, President Kier and Vice President Machar that this is their opportunity. This is an historic opportunity. This country, the newest country in the world, ha has a second chance. Not many countries do. You often have decades and decades of turmoil before that second chance comes. So South Sudan, mere two and a half years after the war began, has another chance to uh, uh, right the ship, to turn it around. To, to miss the next iceberg. And I think that for, the, for, for both the, the vice president and the president, it is incumbent upon them to show leadership, to stop the corruption, to demand from their troops uh, that there no more atrocities will occur, to stop the fighting, to uh, implement all of the terms of the peace deal, to start holding leaders to account 
for human rights violations. All of these things are part of a lasting peace, and it's really in their hands. They are the leaders. They need to show leadership, and we're going to hold them accountable if they don't. Pratagas says unchecked greed is the main conflict driver in South Sudan, where politicians have mobilized armed elements on the basis of ethnicity, leading to horrific crimes in the country. In East Africa, Kenya hosts the first ever Jazz Club Summit on Friday to address the elephant poaching crisis in Africa and work towards a lasting solution for the conservation of the continent's wildlife. The two-day event is expected to have the largest gathering of African presidents, corporate leaders, philanthropists and scientists dedicated to ending the illegal killing of elephants and rhinos. According to Richard Leakey, chairman of the Kenya's Wildlife Service, poaching has surged in the last few years across sub-Saharan Africa where gangs kill elephants and rhinos uh, to feed Asia's demand for ivory and horns. A 2014 United Nations and Interpol report estimated that about 20,000 to 25,000 elephants were killed in Africa every year out of a total population of as many as 650,000. Now nearly 1,300 rhinos were killed illegally in Africa last year. At the end of the summit, Kenya is set to destroy at least 105 tons of its ivory stockpile in an effort to galvanize global support for a total trade ban. Well, as elephant crop uh, raiding continues to be a major source of human wildlife conflict in Kenya, one elephant researcher is helping to alleviate the problem with beehive fences. Viewers Jill Craig has more. They are the largest land animals on earth, weighing as much as six tons and measuring up to 7.5 meters long. Despite their size, African elephants still find humans to be their greatest threat. Tens of thousands of these animals are killed every year for their ivory tusks. Researcher Lucy King, head of the Human Elephant Coexistence Program at conservation group Save the Elephants, says that poaching is devastating animal populations across Africa. But another major concern is human wildlife conflict. When elephants raid crops, it causes financial loss to the farmers and potential harm to the elephants. And as the human population grows, other issues follow. The population in Africa is increasing exponentially and the land space for elephants and other large game is shrinking exponentially. Um, corridors are being blocked, infrastructure development is coming up and so I believe the next big challenge for elephants is going to be conflict and that interface between actual farmers and elephants is the one that we're working on and we feel we can do something with. So she did. King learned that when elephants hear this sound, this is how they react. And so the Elephants and Bees Project was born. King and her team worked near Kenya's Savo East National Park, where they helped 22 farmers build and maintain beehive fences, which consist of between 10 and 21 hives, depending on the size of the farmer's plot. The hives are strung along the periphery of the farmer's crops to deter the elephants from crop raiding. The team monitors each farmer's hives carefully taking notes on each one and also working with the farmers to determine the elephant's movements in the area. Local farmer Charity Mwangome, who built her fence in 2012, believes all the buzz. It helps a lot because if the elephants come in and they see the fence, they stop and don't come into the farm. They instead go around. But the beehive fence, which King says has about an 80% success rate, doesn't just help with keeping out the elephants. It also provides farmers with another means to generate income through honey production. And for farmers who are on average making $300 per year, less than a dollar a day, the 30 to 50% income boost makes a big difference. Research Center coordinator Matthew Rudolph says the biggest problem is just keeping up with consumer demand for the honey, which he and other staff members process here at the center. People pick it up as soon as it is jarred. Which promises a sweet future for farmer and elephant alike. Jill Craig, VOA News, Voy, Kenya. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Well, coming up, Medicines on Frontiers urges a pharmaceutical giant to slash the price of its uh, pneumonia vaccine for poor children. Stay with us.
This is Living Better. Strokes are a common cause of disability. They happen when blood and vessels in the brain leaks out or blood flow is blocked. University of Oxford researchers are looking at the possibility that electrical stimulation could be a benefit to recovering stroke patients for reasons that are not yet fully understood. What we think, think it does is just allow the brain cells to fire just a little bit more. That's Dr. Charlotte Stagg at Oxford. She says that stroke patients who received electrical stimulations called transcranial direct current stimulation showed better improvements at manual tasks than those who just received physiotherapy. What we think stimulation does is just increase the rate at which those cells are firing and so um, speed up the learning of that new skill. Strokes affect some 17 million people worldwide every year. Millions die from stroke, and it's the most common cause of disability in the West. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. Let's have for our health report. And joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu with news about the pneumonia vaccine. Hello, Lino. Médecins Sans Frontières has delivered a petition with uh, hundreds of thousands of signatures to Pfizer urging the pharmaceutical giant to slash the price of its pneumonia vaccine for poor children. MSF says many regions of the world cannot afford to vaccinate children against the disease, the acute respiratory infection, which costs about 10 US dollars for the Pfizer vaccine and comes in three doses. The same request was made to GlaxoSmithKline. JSK's vaccine cost about $9. MSF and its supporters want those prices cut roughly by half in all developing nations and for humanitarian groups. Pneumonia accounts for 15 percent of all deaths of children under five years old. Now the World Health Organization is calling on countries to reach more children missed by routine vaccine delivery systems, including children in conflict zones. April 24 to 30th is World Immunization Week, marked every year during the last week of April. The World Health Organization says more than 60% of children who are unvaccinated live in 10 countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, India, and the Philippines. Jean-Marie Okwobele is director of the Department of Immunization, Vaccines, and Biologicals with the World Health Organization. Today, we estimate that there are about 15 to 20 percent of children who are not receiving the immunization. And they live in countries with conflicts. They live in countries where we have weak uh, uh, health services. Uh, they live in countries where, you know, vaccines are not readily affordable uh, so that they all can get them. The WHO has outlined further steps countries can take to close the immunization gap and meet global vaccination targets by 2020. In terms of the final benefits that we want to see uh, for immunization, in other words, 100% coverage is what is required so that we can make sure that the disease uh, transmission is interrupted nearly everywhere worldwide. In 2012, the World Health Assembly endorsed the Global Vaccine Action Plan, a commitment to ensure that no one misses out on viral immunizations. Despite all the efforts, we really need to close the gap on immunization coverage. As of today, one child out of five still miss in basic immunization coverage. And that is leads to a significant number of deaths that can be prevented for diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea, diphtheria, tetanus, very simple and basic diseases for which we have a immunization that can prevent them. The WHO says only one out of six targets is on track, the introduction of new or underutilized vaccines in low and middle income countries. Joining us in the studio for more on the pneumonia vaccine and immunization week is uh, Robert Steinglass, the immunization technical advisor for USAID's flagship maternal and child survival program, JSI. Mr. Steinglass, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. So MSF is uh, advocating to have the cost of the pneumonia vaccine cut in half. Uh, and 15% of children under five are dying from pneumonia alone. Is, it, is the cost of the vaccine one of the main reasons why so many children are dying? It's one of the reasons, and of course, 
uh, if the price of the vaccine comes down, it means with the same fixed amount of investment in vaccines, you can immunize more children. So I think it's a good thing to try to drive the price down as, as much as possible. Um, at the same um, time, uh, you want the vaccine uh, industry to continue to participate in the programs. You don't want to scare all of the manufacturers away. So there's a fine balance and a dance that takes place. But the vaccines do need to come down. I think the manufacturers have already recovered most of their investment costs on some of these vaccines. Okay, interesting. Now, what do you make of the immunization gap that we are seeing? Well, the children in the world are being reached at about 80% coverage levels in most countries, most regions. So that's a huge success story. Uh, and because we've been so successful, it's naturally time that we turn our attention to figure out how to reach the missing children. UNICEF calls them the fifth child, the last 20% of children. And there are many reasons why those children aren't being reached. Uh, and uh, of course, cost of vaccine is one, but it's probably not even the most important reason. Okay, what would you say is one of the most important reasons? Well, uh, you know, in many countries, the health system as a whole isn't terribly well developed, including in parts of Africa and parts of Asia. And the immunization program is part of the health system. So if the health system isn't strong, if health facilities aren't present, if health workers aren't being trained, and if um, uh, uh, health posts aren't being staffed. These are other important reasons why kids aren't being reached. Also, the, the last 20% of the kids are going to be always the most difficult to reach. They're going to be living in remote areas, urban slums. They're sometimes marginalized populations. So it's sometimes simply more difficult to reach those remaining kids. Mm -hmm. Now, this past February, there was a major conference on vaccine, vaccination in Africa, the ministerial conference, which you took part in. And what were some of the... Uh, what, what were some of the uh, planning in terms of uh, what's ahead for immunization in Africa? What were some of uh, the discussion points and resolutions that were put? Right. Well, first of all, this was an unusual conference in many ways. It was the first time that ministers of health, the people in charge of the health programs in these countries, uh, were at a same, the same meeting with ministers of finance. And of course, you know, those are the people who control the money. Absolutely. Uh, as well as ministers of education in some cases. And I think all countries in Africa were represented. So it was a very high visibility political uh, occasion to uh, explain to ministers of finance why investments in health and particularly in immunization is such a, uh, a good buy and, and, and why there's such a big bang for the buck. So the ministers of finance heard how if you even invest one dollar in immunization, the return on investment, which is of course what motivates them, mm -hmm. is about sixteen dollars. It's what my grandmother used to tell me. She used to say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. It's in the same one to sixteen ratio. Okay. So I think the ministers became aware of the importance of immunization and the need to invest their own resources. The governments need to also step up to the plate and invest their own resources. And I think they heard that message loud and clear. And in five seconds, what the takeaway for this World Immunization Week? Well, we've got to um, uh, continue to invest in immunization. Kids are being born all the time. We can't uh, lower our guard. We, we've got to do a better job. Thank you so much. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that was uh, Robert Steinglass. He's the immunization technical advisor for USAID's flagship maternal and child survival program, JSI. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch for more health news, find me on Twitter at Lenore Moudou. Vincent? Thanks a lot, uh, Lenore. And be sure to watch Lenore Madu's health reports every Tuesday and Thursday right here on Africa 54. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, the latest in home security technology. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Twitter reported lower than expected revenue for the first quarter, hurt by weaker than expected spending by big advertisers. The social media's user base grew modestly to 310 million monthly active users in the quarter that ended on March 31st from 305 million in the fourth quarter above analysts' expectations. Now, Twitter has struggled with stagnant user growth as its complicated interface makers makes it less interactive to new users. Well, next up, it has been five years since the last NASA astronaut flew from Cape Canaveral to the International Space Station. Now, a new group is preparing for a trip, but this time it will be an, on a private commercial spacecraft. NASA currently is paying Russia to ferry astronauts to the International Space Station. Uh, the space agency wants to continue outsourcing those tasks so it can focus on getting astronauts out of low Earth orbit and onto Mars and other destinations. Uh, the agency has contracted Boeing and another U.S. company, SpaceX, to transport astronauts to the space station. Uh, the cost for a ride on a private American-operated spacecraft will be $58 million, cheaper than Russia's $76 million per ride. That's according to NASA. Test flights are scheduled to begin in 2017. Well, and in more high-tech news, a French tech company has developed a futuristic indoor security camera. The Netatmo presence uses smart facial recognition technology to identify family members and alert homeowners to unwanted visitors. When they enter the home and are recognized by the camera, it sends alerts to the owner's smartphone via a dedicated app. The camera requires just a couple of glimpses of a person's face before it builds up a picture. Netatmo's smart home camera joins an ever-widening trend in Internet of Things devices. According to U.S. research firm Gatner, 6.4 billion connected things will be in use worldwide this year, up, up to 30, rather up 30 percent in comparison to 2015. And that is what is trending today. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight, at 8 and Android UTC. And in the mornings, too, Daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC. That is Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words, where we teach you about words in the news. You might have heard this word in a story about international trade. Burmese officials say new investments help support political reforms, but U.S. officials could tighten sanctions again if those reforms do not continue. Sanctions. This means one or more countries have stopped or limited trade with another nation. It often is because the country being sanctioned is not obeying international law. Sanctions also can include limiting economic aid to a country. Now, when you hear the word sanctions, your English will be good enough to know what it means. For more news words, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com.